All right. So thank you for showing up, everyone. Thank you, Melissa, for joining us. And today, I just want to say, you know, it's a great sunny, warm day, at least here on the island. Uh, and I just want to give a quick intro. So with us today is Mandisa Washington. She's an award-winning lead mobile developer at CUNY Brooklyn College. And today, she's going to be talking to us about, you know, the mobile game development pipeline, like what you should consider when thinking from idea to the Play Store. Mandisa, handing it over to you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, happy to be here. Um, so basically, uh, the, the, the general gist of my talk um, is it's a little bit of a half and half. So it's uh, about half uh, business development, um, design considerations, basically what you would need to think of going from just the general concept of this is the game that I want, but what are the considerations you need to have with mobile? And then the 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 back half is more a little bit of a, I'm not going to say a technical deep dive. Let's call it a technical medium dive. <laughs> as far as if you're working with Unity, which, is, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with Unity, what, how you translate those mobile considerations into tech considerations. Um, and obviously some of those are just sort of um, part of the mobile platform. And then others, will you'll have to kind of tailor to your game or to your engine, that kind of thing. Um, I think we're going to have time for questions at the end, so feel free. But if, you know, if I hit something and you're just like, what the heck is that? You know, what the heck is that? I don't understand. <laughs> feel free to either throw it in the chat or just let me know. All right. No problem. I, I, I think I can see people's tiles, so I think we'll be okay. Um, so the first thing I like to start with is kind of just, uh, you know, get your definitions, right? Like mobile game, right? The first thing you might think of is the usual thing, just a game on a phone, um, you know, just like any other platform. But the nature of where we're at right now is that mobile platforms have sort of expanded to encompass uh, things as far as like VR, um, you know, certain kinds of standalone or system on chip devices. Um, and of course, what a game is has itself, it's, it's sort of an involving um, medium. So I like to put up this slide just because it sort of gives you like this cross section of when we say mobile games, we're covering everything from like literally like, you know, a traditional actual game um, to, you know, Harold Halibut is game, but it's a very cinematic experience. Um, this is one that Unity had profiled uh, a hospital um, consult or healthcare consultant had built out essentially like a VR uh, operating room. So essentially they could reach out to clients and have people actually essentially plan out what their OR would be, you know, obviously with a much lower overhead than actually having to travel people around and stuff. Um, and then this other one is um, BMW uh, was working on a simulator for their autonomous vehicles. Now the autonomous vehicles are not run off of games and not necessarily run off of mobile devices, but it's um, the hardware simulation aspect. Since the hardware is constrained in the cars, uh, they were able to use Unity to build a PC-based simulator that essentially mimics what kind of a system is in the cars. So especially if you're coming at it, like I, I am coming at it from a programming standpoint, um, just being able to think in terms of what is the possibility space out there where do we fit in as developers? Where do we fit in from a career standpoint? Um, you know, the world of mobile games is essentially much, much larger than most people uh, necessarily think from a casual, uh, you know, even within the industry uh, perspective. Okay, so the the basic gist is these are these are basically the points we're going to go through um, on the business side. Uh, I'm going on the assumption it's like if you already have in your head, this is the idea for the game. You might even already have a game that's on like PC. And how do you translate that into mobile, right? It's not just, okay, sure, we just flip the switch mobile and then boom, you put it out there. Um, there there's a lot of nuance to it that isn't always covered in the more technical um, um, explorations, right? So uh, you want to look at everything from the idea itself to see if it itself is mobile ready through all of the different points that you would normally go through in game development, but from a mobile perspective or with the lens as to what the needs on mobile are. So, okay, so our first question, 
it's just straight up like is this a mobile game right like is this a game that is suitable for mobile right and so you you got to do your due diligence you need to look up similar games you know everybody's game is a special unique snowflake but of course there are going to be similarities with other games um you you want to see what have other people done uh the main thing to think about is you want bite-sized gameplay right so you want people to essentially have a satisfying experience but in the context that people usually use their mobile devices, right? People are on the go, people are on the toilet, people are waiting for the train, whatever it is, they may have a short or a, uh, you know, an ambiguous amount of time, right? You don't know when the train is coming. You don't know when you're going to have to put that phone away. Maybe the baby's going to cry, whatever. And so you want to be able to organize your game loops along the lines of matching how people are actually going to play. So if you have something like, you know, a real-time strategy with like a 45 minute long, you know, uh, uh, multiplayer competition where it's like, you you can't leave like that may not necessarily be the best um, approach for, for bite-sized gameplay. There are definitely obviously mobile um, uh, mobile games out there that are super popular that have those kinds of systems but it's usually with the context that people will be playing those. They'll adjust the mobile to match the game as opposed to the game matching the mobile, if that makes sense. Um, then you've got your standard sort of technical limitations, um, you know, uh, thinking about what your input can be. You know, there's your touch screen, but there's also things like the accelerometer, you know, GPS, if you're talking about a location-based game. Even now you've got uh, AR built into especially the, the newer iPhones. So these are all things to keep in mind. Um, memory is still always going to be a consideration, even as mobile devices get better um, and have more memory to, at your disposal, especially, you know, more advanced uh, graphics memory. Um, you're still obviously going to have less than a PC. You're going to have less than a console. So you just always want to keep those things in mind. And then obvious things like sort of screen size, um, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, covering a a broad mobile market you know phones can be very small and people's hands as relative to them can be quite large so you really want to think about you don't want to put all your cool stuff and have it essentially be covered up by by the you know by users um and the usual things apply to to as with any game you know talking it over with people you know if you want you you push your game out you know test it out test out the ui on a phone just see, you know, even before you've invested any time into actual development, just giving an idea to yourself of how is this kind of going to work. And then you've got, again, mostly these are standard across any kind of game or any kind of product. Who is the audience who's actually going to use this? Um, you do, of course, want to think of this in terms of who is on mobile and what are they looking for? Um Every platform is not identical. You know, what people are looking for on Xbox may not be what they're looking for on iOS, right? So, um, and you don't necessarily want to just feed into like pre-existing biases or assumptions. You want to, again, just do the research and look for who are mobile gamers, what kind of genres are they looking for? It may not match Steam, but, you know, you want to give it that thought and and just see if, you know, if, if your idea dovetails with that. And of course, um, if you're, if you're in a hobby space, then this doesn't matter. But if you're in a commercial space, you want to think of, would I pay for this? Right? Like, is this, is this, an, is this something that I would pay for? And again, in the context of mobile, where the pricing strategies, the monetization can be more, in some cases, a lot more complex, or in some cases, very straightforward, but you just want to be able to make sure you're getting that, uh, that value proposition for your players. Um, and, and just keep that in mind. And so again, the skills, this is all pretty standard. Um, you know, if you're getting your team together, you want to make sure you have all your bases covered. Uh, the only thing I really wanted to point out here is that from a mobile perspective, I would say these two, programming and graphics, that's really where you want to sort of hone in and make sure that whoever you're getting has some experience, not just in those fields, but in those fields on mobile, just because. I mean, the business and the marketing can be relatively similar, but the graphics and the programming uh, needs can be very specific. And if you're talking about putting together a team that can hit the ground running, that's really one of you, where you want to uh, put some of your focus. 
Okay, so the big question everybody loves, everybody asks this question. Mm -hmm. Android or iOS? Um, it used to be more of a technical question. Um, I would say for most games at this point, for most users, it's pretty much at parity now. Um, you know, you can find Android phones that are this, you know, functionally the same under the hood as as iOS, you know, as iPhones. Um, and of course, you know, the some of the arguments about diversity of platforms and having to test across multiple phones, that's kind of going away. There's like 20 odd iPhones now. So you kind of have to, to be able to cover all your bases. Um, the key things to keep in mind are sort of the attitude and the ecosystem. Um, Android is very much concerned with backwards compatibility. That's going to be something that even as they've moved into uh, like kind of nudging people to sort of keep up with the current state, that's still going to be a very large concern for them. They're going to test your game against different um, Android versions going back, uh, different phone and, and tablet versions going back. So that's kind of something you want to keep in mind. Apple is a little bit the opposite there. It's all about, are you keeping up with the bleeding edge? So the users have a tendency to move in more of a pack. You know, they won't all be on whatever is the latest and greatest iOS version, but the uh, the clustering will be a lot tighter on Apple. Whereas Google, you've got a much longer tail since generally speaking, those phones don't get uh, major new updates. Um, so it's one of those things where if you are preparing a game and you're going to release it on mobile, you want to think about what your long-term support strategy is going to be on both sides. Is it going to be something where you're maybe more aligned with Android, with keeping up with the, you know, making sure those older devices aren't left behind? Or is it going to be something where you're keeping up more with Apple, where you're updating your game to make sure it's compatible, it's essentially forward compatible with whatever is the new thing? And then, of course, from a business perspective, You've got this fundamental difference. Um, you know, Android is a one-time, you know, pay it and pay it once and that's it. You're an Android developer. Apple's got this subscription model where you have to pay every year. Um, and again, you have to have a Mac to publish on Apple. Um, you don't necessarily need a Mac to develop and test your game on on iOS. And I'll get to that on the the tech side. But um, but when you do that last push to the app store, the, the Mac is gonna have to be in there. So it's you know. Macs are expensive, so it's one of those things to think about. Okay, so the business models, um, depending on who you ask, maybe this entire chart could be just condensed down to this in-app purchases. <laughs> but um, but all of these other models are still out there. They can still be viable um, depending on what you're making, especially if you're talking about for an indie you know, an indie developer, an indie team, um, like I'm a solo developer, uh, you know, I don't necessarily need the same kind of scale as, you know, somebody like Blizzard needs, right? So you do, it does behoove you to sort of look at your game and see what kind of monetization works for it. It may or may not be the same as what it is on like PC or Steam or, or, um, or console. Um, again, those markets, those players have their own expectations as far as monetization. Mobile is just coming from different expectations. Um, and so, you know, your discoverability is going to be very, very different. And again, looking at how people play the game on mobile, pe people may be more willing to uh, accept things that are totally natural on that platform that on other platforms may be seen as intrusive or an annoyance. Um, so you really, you know, to a certain degree, you can take the same game, you know, your your core ideas, your core design, um, your core game loops, to a certain degree, that can stay the same universally. You know, people are playing the same game, but you do want to give some thought, especially if you're early on in the process, um, in the design process, or if you're considering mobile ports down the line, you might want to give some thought to how those things are going to be the same across platforms and maybe how they're going to diverge. And then here's the part I, I pe some people are like, ah, I don't want to think about the legal stuff till the end, but I, I, you know, I'm a programmer. I've been in this business a long time. Um, I guess I've, I've, I've sort of been in the games business a little while. Um, but these are kinds of things you, you want to keep in mind. Um, uh, and it applies to artists too, to a certain degree. Uh, so this first one is kind of big. If you're on the job, depending on what kind of company you're working for, um, 
they may feel that they have an ownership stake in whatever you create. I think um, I want to say Amazon had recently like this spring, either the spring or during the winter, they had actually rescinded their policy that used to say this, where it was like, even if you were coding on nights and weekends, they kind of felt like they owned your work or at least had some kind of rights towards it. That to me sounds a little bit mm, questionable, but it's something that you want to make sure that you're aware of up front. Um, you know, you don't want to get caught by something like that after the fact. It applies as well to certain schools and universities. Um, I would say, especially outside the United States um, or at uh, in the United States at certain for-profit universities, they do have policies that can be uh, similar along these lines. Like if you use their equipment or if you use software that you got access to through the school, that may open up whatever you create. Um, it may open up that IP to be sort of partially owned by them. So something to look into. Um, not mobile specific, but it, it's just something I feel like doesn't get talked about enough. Um, then you've got, again, some basic business things about, you know, how do you want to publish? You know, how do you want to do, especially if you're an indie? These are things that aren't necessarily as onerous as people make them out to be. But it's just a, you know, do your homework thing and look into it. Um, this international pricing part, that does come into play on mobile a lot, especially since in mobile, both the App Store and the Google Play Store, they can take into account, um, you know, they'll they'll do your pricing automatically for you if you want. You could say like, I want it to be 99 cents US and then whatever that is everywhere else, just make it that. But um, like we were talking about before the chat, um, you know, economies are different, cost of living is different. A 99 cent app in the US, even a 599 app in the US might be like, eh, that's not a big deal. But in another place where, you know, money is more precious, um, not that money's not precious here, but still it might just doing a straight conversion may not be appropriate to what you're doing. And so it's just, it's, it's one of those little things that tends to catch people up after they're already through the process after they've already gone and put their app on the store and then they're looking and they're like, why is my 99, why is my 99 cent app not selling the way I expect it to? And it's like, well, because in this other country, you're asking $20. Okay. So like that, that equivalent. So, um, so that's really one of those things that maybe you should think about earlier in the process. And then now it's the tech side. Um, you know, I, I, I do like to tell people if you're learning something, don't learn with your baby, right? Like, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't test out new strange things um, um, with something precious to you. So um, I like uh, this Unity Rollable tutorial because they have it for free. And that's a good one to just practice sort of porting uh, PC to mobile and just, you know, play around with it because um, it's very simple and, uh, and, and you can get a feel for what I'm talking about as far as like the possibility spaces and, you know, what the concerns are. Okay. So unity, um, I guess I could give into a whole thing about like unity versions and that kind of thing, but I'm not going to do that. So this is just like, this is essentially like, like I said, a medium dive, right? So if your eyes start to glaze over, please bear with me. Um, it will be pretty quick, but, uh, these are just basically some, key settings and not necessarily the specifics of the tech if you're not a programmer, but even if you're a designer and you're just sort of thinking about how to put together a game for mobile or, you know, or similarly, you know, one of these places that's sort of running on a mobile-like platform like, like VR, um, these are things that you might want to just keep in mind and it can help inform you when you're having those conversations with programmers. Um, you know, so you don't necessarily have to take notes as far as like whatever, like the specific settings or whatever. I'm not going to get that deep, but uh, but these are just things that you want to maybe jot down as far as questions to ask if you're bringing somebody on board your team, or things to keep in mind when you're coming up with those game loops in the first place. Uh, so this uh, this is kind of your key thing um, on mobile. You you can change the name of your game. You can change how much the price is. You can change all the things. But what they call the package or the bundle ID, that is forever. So like whatever you come up with, that's that's pretty much what you're locked into. Um, generally speaking, it's tied to your domain, um, especially nowadays where a lot of games essentially rely on things like their Steam page and they don't necessarily have their own web domain. 
Um, this can actually end up being a little bit of a tripping point. It's going to be the first thing they ask for, and it's something you have to bake into your game. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, basic things like the version and the build number, the minimum operating system that you're going to support. Again, unlike, say, on PC, where you can kind of just put your game out there and be like, look, so long as I'm not doing anything really bleeding edge, pretty much any PC can run this. You know, you can be very kind of loosey-goosey with your system specs. Um, on mobile, you actually have to bake all of that in. If you're going to support uh, phones from the last, say, five years, you have to actually figure out what those versions are, what that range is, and you have to bake that in. Um, that can affect things like your design. That could affect things like the features that you can support, the phone's features you can support. Um, that can affect certain things like security concerns if you have uh, networking or multiplayer in your game. Um, and, you know, I mean, some basics like things like, oh, does the phone have a camera? Um, you know, does the phone support, you know, a, a soft keypad or whatever? Like, those are all things that can be affected by what kind of phone you're supporting, what kinds of actual features does that phone have, especially augmented reality. That is a very fast moving field. Um, you know, so those are considerations that you have to put in. I think with Pokemon Go, they did have to kind of cap it to relatively recent phones. So these are all sorts of things that, even though they seem like sort of low-level technical concerns or things that you could really, you know, push off till later, some of them can be, uh, they can have sort of foundational impact on, on how your game is going to play out, whether your game is even going to be able to be shipped on mobile in, in the form that you want to the people that you want. Um, and then other basics, you know, the name and the icon. Um, I, I'll, I'll share the link to the deck at the end, but um, uh, both the Android and the iOS developer website, even if you're using Unity, it's good to just sort of keep up with the uh, changes and the notes that are on the actual platform website. This applies to if you're going to um, one of the alternate stores like Samsung's own store um, or any of the uh, regional stores that are out there other than like the big Google Play and, and Apple App Store. And I, like I said, I'm not going to get deep into like what all these settings do. This is really essentially like a signifier slide. Um, most of those settings that I discussed are are in here. They're they're either baked into Unity or um, in the docs. It'll explain like how you set them. My main point here is just to keep in mind that uh, a version control is your friend, but that uh, on Unity, particularly since it's designed for multi-platform from jump. Uh, there are going to be settings that are platform specific. And so the main thing is just you make sure that whatever platform you're currently working in or you're planning to work in, you've just looked over these settings, you know, go on onto those developer sites. Uh, iOS is the same deal. Um, you know, just you can essentially just keep track of what all of those settings are, uh, the ones that are going to be universal for all your platforms and the ones that are going to be platform specific. And again, so long as you've got version control, you're checking all that stuff in. Um, maybe you're keeping a separate document of what your settings are. You're, you're probably golden. Um, you know, some of it is related to stuff like graphics, which is, you know, it kind of affects an earlier part of the process. So it's a good idea to, you know, just give it a look over. Then the input part, this is kind of the juicy part I like. Um, so on mobile, uh, like I said, it's it's one of those weird situations where we're it's almost like we're going back in time to the age of like arcades and early consoles like the Atari and stuff where or or the Amiga or something where it's like you kind of even in designing your game you kind of have to keep the hardware capabilities in mind from the beginning um so this this is where it's like like a lot of those early ports and and you still see it somewhat um, ports of games that were obviously designed as like PC games and they just dumped them onto mobile. And it's like, you'll see the stupid floaty joysticks or, um, I mean, they're not stupid, but they're, they're kind of a stopgap. Like mobile, mobile first players don't really dig it. Um, but you've got a lot of toys to play with, like, you know, the accelerometer, uh, uh, the gyroscope, um, you know, there's there's just a lot of stuff that you effectively get for free that's built in. Um, and especially like on on Android, you've got 50 million kinds of dongles. Um, 
I remember uh I remember when we was big, uh some guy had written a a driver so you could use Bluetooth to link up a Wiimote to your phone. And so I was using that to play like RPGs on my phone. <laughs> And, you know, but with like a, a, you know, a Wiimote and a classic controller and stuff. So it's like you've got a lot of goodies beyond that touchscreen. Um, and while, yes, it's, you know, mobile is more constrained in, as far as like um, memory and the screen size and that kind of thing. It also, I mean, y- you know, y- you don't get a gyroscope. Gener- well, I mean, I guess in the, con- the newer controls, right? But but generally speaking, right? Like like if somebody is playing on a PlayStation, like their GPS is not really germane to the gameplay, right? So you 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 have a lot of toys in the toy box, or I guess tools in the toolbox, either way. And uh, those are all things that you want to kind of think about and, and play around with. Um, one of the cool things that that Unity did come up with um, in the last couple of years. It was what they call their new input system. I think it's like three years old now, so I don't know if it still counts as new. But um, but one of the things that it does is it kind of lets you abstract out all of those peculiarities of input so that you can essentially design your game for, um, you know, sort of generic level. This is the going to be the button for primary attack. This is going to be secondary attack. This is going to be canceled. It's going to be okay, whatever it is. And then you can map that out to different profiles and that's also runtime um editable uh you know it's actually patchable you can you can make that available online through through their you know uh they have um what do you call it the addressable system you can make that available online so people could conceivably you could without necessarily repatching your game which on some platforms can be onerous um you can essentially make additional input mechanisms available and just set that up. I mean, that's not specific to mobile, but mobile tends to be where it, uh, it, it becomes more of an issue since you are supporting so many different kinds of devices. Um, and then again, you know, there's the fat finger issue. Um, you know, there's it, ergonomics is generally not something you used to have to think about in the course of game design. I mean, maybe if you were a controller, uh, manufacturer, but like not, not, not for the game developers. Um, but but it actually is now like there are issues as far as when you're designing a mobile UI, um, not just, oh, are people's hands covering up too much of the screen? But like, can you actually reach right? Like if you're holding your phone, is it is it going to be portrait? Is it going to be landscape? Where are your phones going to be? How long can the average thumb go? Right. I don't know if I have an average thumb, but I have, I have thumbs. <laughs> yeah, I know my thumb is not three inches long. Right. Like I'm, I'm very sure of that. So um, these are all things that, again. Sometimes people put them off to sort of the end of the development and be like, oh, we'll sort that out at the end. Don't don't give yourself that kind of agita. Just think about it at the beginning. You could do it on paper, you know, set up a post-it and just sketch out where things are generally going to be. Do a gray box mock-up, whatever. Um, and you're golden. Um, and then this last bit is just conditionals. This is this is probably the most uh techie thing I'm gonna have in this talk, but basically. Um, there's preprocessor directives where you can fine tune in your code to look at what operating system you're on, what version of operating system, what have you. And then, um, I have an example here, but like, basically you can drill down and be like, if you're on this specific platform or this specific version, you could have specific versions of your code with fallbacks. Um, fallbacks are your friend. Again, you're supporting a lot of different devices. There's always going to be new devices. Samsung's got their foldable phone now. How the hell is that supposed to work, right? Like, how are you supposed to figure for that? So all of those things, there's a certain amount of... It's it's a little bit future-proofing, but it's it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like when you do a renovation in your house. You don't want to... You don't want to do the renovation in such a way that you're going to have to do it again next year. You kind of want to think ahead a little bit. And make sure that you're 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 planning for as far out as you can. Um, it's entirely the case in the current market that you could put a mobile game out there and then effectively walk away from it, and you could still have money trickling in years later. So these are things that if you give them the time and attention and the care up front, you're you're you know you you won't have a lot of well you'll have some headache, but you won't have as much. I'll put it that way. Um, then again, you know, Unity Hub, they've got the build settings. They've made this as straightforward as possible. If you want to add Android or iOS support to your Unity install, 
you literally just check a box android or ios like it's not um it's it's not rocket science it's okay um and yeah like i said um you know this build package issue just make sure you've got that that id you know either written down or, or locked in um this used to be more of a concern where you had to have an encrypted key that goes along with your game so people can't just rip it um but uh increasingly the stores are moving towards you providing them you essentially have you get use a password and they store your key basically the main thing is once you've encrypted your game with a given key you need to keep that key otherwise you won't have access to the game anymore to to do patches or anything um so they've been sort of moving that responsibility over to the store side um it can still be an issue if you're going to be dealing with um international distribution multiple stores um special stores in china i'm not sure how they handle it but um encryption is one of those sort of touchy issues um especially from a u.s based developer where you want to just make sure you're not tripping over any uh laws <laughs> and uh, you just want to make sure everything's cool um yeah, again, you need a Mac for that final build. Um, and yeah, and in Unity, it's just basically you switch the platform and then it does a bunch of stuff on the back end, updating your graphics and, and you're, you're solid. Again, version control and, you, and you'll be fine. Uh, yep, this is just what the build settings looks like on Android and on iOS. It's very similar. Um, and then there you go. You, once you have your game, um, one of the things is while you have to pay the developer fees, like I said, to put your game on the stores, you know, on the on like the Play Store or the App Store, you don't actually have to do that to run it on your own devices, either your personal device or, or in some cases your team's device if they're physically present. Um, on Android, there's something called developer settings. It's essentially like a hidden setting, secret knock. And you basically just go to, um, like, I mean, you'll look it up, but it's basically like just a setting in your um you know in any phone and you click on it seven times and then that's it this new developer settings menu appears magically and it's kind of funny it's like you'll tap on it three times it'll be like four more taps and you're a developer five more taps and you're a developer and i'm like oh if it was only that easy but um but yeah but that that's all that is to it and then on apple again you can create the account for free um and then if you have Mac, a Mac and, and once you install Xcode, that's that's the development environment over there. Um, you can install your game. You can you can build it out just from Unity um, and run it on your phone, um, you know, to test out for yourself. Or if you have um, there's a limit, but it's like uh, if you have somebody else's device and you could physically plug it into your, your computer, they can run this game on their their phone. Usually it's capped out, I think, like 24 hours or something like that. So it'll expire, but it's good for testing. And it's still a little bit buggy, but Unity did set up a device simulator um, so that you can essentially test out your UI or even um, run your game. You know, there's a, a remote version essentially, so you can remote the game, stream it to your phone, test it out. Um, it's not, I wouldn't call it production ready yet, but it's worth playing around with if you want to play around. And I, I gave a link to a, a YouTube video where they played around with it. And then, you know, that's that's kind of it. Um, you know, all the usual stuff. Um, mobile makes it really easy to share your game with with friends, so long as they're, like, physically near you. Um, on Android, you don't have to, like, root your phone or anything. You could just, so long as other people do that developer settings thing, one of the settings in there is to allow um, installing apps that didn't come from the Play Store. So, you know, you could just print it. You know, you could essentially just create a... a, a package up your game and then literally just mail it to people, you know, and just say, Hey, check it out. And you don't necessarily have to go through the store, um, which again, can be really helpful for things like beta tests and that kind of thing. Close betas, um, testing on dis different devices that has been true since the very beginning of mobile. It's still true. Now, every device is going to be different. There's always going to be some undocumented hang up or some garbage or whatever. Um, put in as many mobile friendly features as you can. People love that. They eat it up. Um, <laughs> this is one I always like, especially here, I'm, I'm based in New York. This is one I always bring up to people because people discount it. Um, so many apps, especially coming from the U S um, to some degree in Europe, though, not as much 
they think about it in terms of either their own language or maybe like, you know, in Canada, it'll be like U.S. and um, English and French. But if you know people, if you yourself are bilingual, translating into multiple languages is key. And especially for indies where you can kind of, you know, you, you need every leg up you can get. Um, and localization, good localization is expensive. Um, you definitely should look into that. But if you're still at the level of just testing things out, again, things like the UI, you know, uh, hello in, in, in English might be like, you know, 20 characters or something in another language. So, so these are all things that you could do to just kind of like get a leg up on your development, especially since mobile does, like I said, allow you to, you know, kind of um farm out your your testing to to especially if they're local um other developers or other people who are you know just in your orbit um so if you can you know i mean the stats are there you can probably look it up but um just having multiple language support in your app automatically uh especially in a platform that where discoverability is so brutal just being able to like, hey, we have this in Latin American Spanish, or we have this in in Thai or something. Like, just being able to do that automatically puts your, you know, peaks your head up a little bit above everybody else. Um, so it's a good way to kind of meet your audience where they are, even if they're literally on the other side of the world. Um, and then again, you know, th like I said, this was like the shallow to medium thing. So if you want to get into the nitty gritty and the, the weeds, definitely look into all of the docs that they have. Um, Android Studio and Xcode are the development environments for Android and iOS, respectively, both free. Uh, they run on, I mean, they don't run on a shoebox, but they run on basically anything. And, uh, and, and yeah, just go in there and play around with it. Um, you're probably not going to break anything. It's okay. <laughs> and yeah, have fun. Everybody loves to, to make games because people like to play games. And, you know, there's not a lot of products that you can make where if you do a good job, people say, wow, that was awesome. I had fun. You know, maybe if you make roller coasters for a living, I don't know. But um, but yeah, this is this the whole point is supposed to be fun, not, you know, picking people up and shaking the money out of them. So uh, focus on the fun and the rest of it will probably follow along. And that's my talk. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Mandisa. And I think we definitely have a, a, a couple minutes for some questions. So if anybody wants to ask anything, feel free to turn your mic on, or we can just go through the crash course chat. And we do have at least four questions in there right now. OK, let me see. Um, if I'm screen sharing, it's hard for me to actually see the chat. So I can I can read them out for you. It's fine. Oh, okay, sure. So let's see. What, uh, oh, let's see. One from you right off. Uh, ah, uh, let's, let's, let's start at the top. Let's start at the top. Okay, okay. okay. Where, where am I missing? <laughs> right, so Glenn, Glenn asked, um, "Can you give some more examples of bite-sized gameplay?" Okay, okay, cool. Um, so let's see. Uh, you want to think about it usually in terms of. The best way I heard it was actually somebody talking about manga um, was you want to give people a satisfying chunk, right? Like if you have if you have a game where the where the loop involves that you have to play like say a two hour session to to really get all of you know. All, all, to have a really satisfying thing. But if there are, you know, smaller little mini loops within the bigger loop where you can be like, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say you get the little dopamine hit, but still you get like some kind of sense of achievement, right? So, um, you know, in something like, uh, in, I'm trying to think, in something like, I'll say a strategy game because that's what I know, right? So in a strategy game, you know, each battle can conceivably take a fairly long time but if you can have, say, like, you know, party management activities, right? So, like, so you're, you're essentially leaving it up to the player, right? If, if, you, if the player knows, ah, I'm standing here waiting for the train, I probably have about anywhere from three to ten minutes. You know, maybe I'm not going to start a new battle, but I'm going, I'm going to go mess around with my inventory and, and start, you know, messing around with that. Because that's something that I could always just drop in the middle and it's not going to be a whole problem, right? Um, 
So that kind of thing, right? Like it doesn't necessarily have to be that everything in your game has a very short bite-sized payoff, but that you have that ability. You're not just giving people a whole cake and saying, well, if you can't consume this cake in one sitting, then I don't know what to do with you. You're going to be like, here's a slice of cake, right? Like you, this is a manageable amount. You can deal with the slice of cake, you know, maybe even if it's like the little cake pops, right? I mean, uh, Starbucks. Starbucks doesn't really sell you. I mean, I guess they do. The banana nut life slice is great. But but like they have the little cake pops, right? Because it's like, well, people are walking around with this and maybe all they want. Um, what was it? Whole Foods has their two bite brownies or something, right? Like maybe all people can manage in this space. It's just a little, you know, just a little nibble of something. So you want to be able to sort of decompose your game into nibbles. And, you know, so people still get the essence of your game. And certainly if th th people also have the longer time, like you've got people, hey, it's the weekend, the kids are, you know, the kids are at grandma's house. I got eight hours. I'm doing this. Right. So people do have that or they play to relax after, you know, after work. They may have that two hours, but you want to be able to give them choices and options as far as how they want to engage with your game in the context that they have in a, in a given point which is maybe less of an issue on say like pc or console where you can almost always make an assumption if somebody went through the whole trouble of i'm going to turn on the system i'm going to sit down on the couch or i'm going to sit down at my computer i'm going to play this thing you know i've turned off the lights i've put the kids to bed whatever this is my me time you can kind of go on the assumption that they have plenty of time mobile you can't always make that assumption so does that make sense i'll answer for glenn and say yes <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love the reference to the food though. That makes that makes a ton of sense actually. <laughs> um so a question from Pixel Pat is how different would it be to make a running app or a fitness app using Unity over using Android Studio? So so in my day job, I'm gonna switch hats. In my day job, um I actually do uh, mobile development for Brooklyn College. And so that's enterprise development. And for that, I am using uh, native, um, you know, native Java, native Swift um, on, on Android and iOS, respectively. Um, I would say the main differences are, again, your graphics, right? Um, you know, Unity, it's it's built for games. R really, not even just Unity. Unreal, um, I think even Godot. Um, I think, I don't know if it's out of beta, but I think Godot has support to build for mobile. Um, for Android, yes, I'm not sure about iOS, but, um, you know, those are purpose built. They have all your domain specific tools built in. Um, so you can kind of focus on the part that you need to focus on and not focus on how do I support metal? How do I support Vulkan? How do I support OpenGL? Which version of OpenGL? Like you don't, you don't need to be thinking about that when you're trying to develop your game. And again, those are moving targets. A new major, you know, major version of both Android and OS come out on lockstep every year with minor versions throughout, uh, you know, throughout. Um, then sometimes you get situations like last fall, um, we actually had a bit of a kerfluffle because um, because of security reasons, uh, Apple released a rapid fire series of patches to iOS 14 and then finally, they just gave up and just released iOS 15. But for de us developers on the other side, they actually skipped several of those patches. So if you were going to release a game um, and, and you wanted to handle all of that yourself, on top of the usual caveats about, well, with an engine, you get all of this stuff built in. You know, when you're on your own, you, do, you have to do it on your own. There's also the issue of people on mobile have like zero patience for shenanigans. Um, on PC, you know, people may cut you a little bit of slack and be like, okay, I reported this bug. And, you know, now it's like been a week or two or month or two and we haven't heard anything, blah, blah, blah. People on mobile have, ain't nobody got any time for that. So they will like, it'll be like, this doesn't work. I'm quitting the game. One star review. I'm out. And, and you know, like immediately get <laughs> You know, I mean, on the one hand, it's exciting to get that level of feedback so fast. On the other hand, it will drive you mad. So you want to go in eyes open that if you are tackling it from the perspective of I'm going to build this native, um, 
you you do have access to C, uh, you know, to C and C plus plus. I will say that um, both platforms, um, you know, you can get essentially under the hood. And if you know if you're more comfortable in C plus plus, you can code directly in that, and then just do all of the native hookups in 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 Android or in iOS to make that happen. Um, which can be good if you're porting like an older game that's already written in C or something. But um, but it's one of those things where if you break it, you bought it, and people in the app stores they don't see Google, they don't see Apple, they don't see you know, um, the OpenGL consortium or whatever, they see your name, you know, I mean, maybe your game studio or whatever, but they see you. And if your shit isn't working, they will absolutely tell you. Um, so that's just one of those things. If you're comfortable with it, do it. If you're not comfortable with it, there is absolutely no shame. And just be like, yo, I'm going to let Unity handle all of that particular nonsense. And I'm just going to focus on the part that's my game. Um, they do um, one of the things to keep in mind that they they do this handy is they'll have what they call their long term support streams. So you've got their uh, like usually two a year um, bleeding edge releases, and then there's their long term support one where there's only one of those per year. And you're essentially if you release with that Unity version, you're guaranteed, I believe, um, active support for two years, and then like security patch kind of support for more years. I'm not a hundred percent how long. Um, so that, that's definitely a boon, um, as far as, again, maintaining that compatibility, like I said, forward and backward, depending on, on what you're talking about. Does that, does that answer your question? Does that work? Let me see. I can't even see. I, I had to leave, but I'm also going to say yes for him because <laughs> I hadn't, I, I've, I've thought about this question before, like if you shouldn't use unity or just use android studio but yeah i never thought about half of these things so thank you <laughs> yeah, um and then one of my questions was is there an easy way to handle apple and google wanting you to always have your app updated because um, over time i've had two apps on the app store and well one, one was on both ios and android and one was just on android and because i didn't just consistently push updates to it eventually at some point they just took it off and that happens to not even just like small indie devs, but big publishers too. So it's just like, is there any way to prevent that? <laughs> or do you just have to just consistently push updates for whenever, amen? I would say, I mean, I can speak to this because I actually, I had my, my first game on the stores was 2010 or 2011. I think, no, 2012, 2012. And uh, it was a Spirograph game, right? So like colors and, and circles and that kind of thing. Um, is it still there? It was on Google Play, uh, Barnes and Noble Nook, and Amazon. Um, Barnes and Noble Nook went away, which was sad because they made me good money. Um, grandparents are amazing. If you can target grandparents, they will support you. Um, and, and, you know, in a good way. If you entertain them, target them. Not in a bad way. Not in a bad way. Um, uh, Amazon is still up there. I haven't touched it. People still buy it. I could support it. I probably should. But they left it up there, and, and, and there it is. Um, and then on Google Play, uh, I had a choice when GDPR came out as to whether to like incorporate a whole bunch of privacy uh, stuff or not. And I just basically chose to delist it. Um, so that's kind of where you're at. Like, if you well, one of the things you get when you um, set up a developer account on on either platform is you'll get those emails way in advance as far as um, release notes for the upcoming, uh, you know, the te literal technical side, like what's coming down the pipe, what changes. Um, you will get heads up as far as like policy changes anywhere from six months to even two years in advance. Um, so you, you will definitely have the information that you need to decide, you know, looking at uh, you know assuming a commercial game right you can look at the the revenues that are coming in for this game you can look at how much work or whatever would be required to update it and then you you have to make a business decision right of of you know is this still work to me to do this or not and then it's up to you do you want to delist it do you want to essentially like i said where you set a version range you can set an upper range as well and just be like okay 
you know, this this game is only going to support up to, you know, whatever, like iOS 15 and anything beyond that, it just doesn't support. So any players who already have your game, they'll still have it. Like it's not nothing you do is going to take it off their phones, but new players, you know, only people who fit into that bucket are going to be able to see your game. And so hopefully they'll still have a, a positive experience so long as you've tested it on, you know, on those versions. Um, and then, you know, of course, the other option is that you just delist your game. Again, like I said, with the bundle ID is forever, that's still locked in. Your store page, your, your you know, um, any version history, any review history, um, your star rating or whatever. Once you delist, all of that just becomes frozen in time. It's not searchable or accessible through the apps, you know, through whatever app store, but you still have access to it as a developer. So if like, you know, if life happens, right, the pandemic happens or whatever. If you know, I may want to bring this back, but I want some time, you know, I, I don't want the clock running. You can just delist and essentially hit pause. And again, it won't take it off of anybody's phones. All you're doing is saying that you don't want any new people to come in and maybe have that negative experience. The All of the stores and all of the sort of conventional wisdom around, around mobile basically looks at it from the sense of what is going to provide a good experience for the player. And so even some of the things that they come up with that kind of feel <laughs> a little authoritarian, let's say, um, <laughs> generally speaking, it's with the idea that they either want the, the players to have a good experience or they just want to kind of keep them in a control, especially Apple. They're very big on their walled garden and their ecosystem. And they kind of you know, it's 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 definitely more of a we only want things in that garden that we've explicitly put there. No weeds, no stat, no random statues, whatever. So, so long as you keep in mind what your exit strategy is for a game, is this going to be a game that you support forever? Is this going to be something that you just have up there for a couple of years and then you take it down? Um, you know, so long as you keep in mind not just your starting point, but your ending point, you know, are you going to sell it? Right. I mean, that's a totally viable thing too. Um, you know, if you have a, a still successful game, but you just don't have the time to maintain it, find out if somebody else is willing to take it off your hands, you know, they'll pay you for it. You transfer ownership of the game. You don't necessarily have to transfer your account. There's, there's a provision in there to transfer a game. Uh, and then, and then they take it over. Um, that works also if you're doing uh, consulting and you're building games for clients you can build a game, test it, do all that stuff under your developer account with your config and everything. And then like when you're ready to 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 pass it over, you know, you just you just transfer the ownership of it. And then, you know, it's, it's somebody else's baby. So does that does that answer your question? It wasn't my I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> Is my question. Um yeah, it, it definitely definitely did. I didn't realize that Amazon actually just keeps it up because I went and found the first game I worked on, and it's still there. It's chilling, ready to be downloaded. That's that's dope. Um, and I also never thought about having an exit strategy for a game. Like in my mind, you make it, you in this day and age, you do some updates for it, whether it's DLC or just you know regular um, bug fixes and whatnot. And then it's there forever because on PC, they I can go and find a DOS game if I really wanted to. Yeah, but and, even and, 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 so go ahead. Good. Sorry, I was going to say, with, with, with Steam games, you can find games that came out at the start of Steam, you know? Whereas on, especially on, on Android, you can just Google it, and I'm sure you can find the APK. <laughs> but on, especially on, like, on Apple products, you can't, unless you hack your whole phone, you know? So it, it just, it's just very annoying that that's a thing that people have to go through. Well, I, I, think, I think it's almost in a reaction to that, right? So, like... Yes, you can go and you can find like old games from DOS, right? You could, I mean, you could find like, uh, you know, emulators or whatever, of like Amiga games or something. But, but there's sort of a built in assumption that you are going to tinker with it to make it work, right? Like even, I mean, that's, that's the value add for like good old games, right? That's the value add for like the Steam launcher and stuff is that right. the assumption is somebody already did like 85 to 98% of the work to make you know, something that ran on Windows 3.1 run on <laughs> Windows 10. You know, there was a lot of work. I, I know th how much of that work. There was a lot of work involved. And the assumption is that somebody already did a lot of that for you. On mobile, especially since in a lot of cases, you can't get into the phone and really mess up. Not, I mean, you, you get 
some set ex- settings exposed, but you can't really, I mean, you could root your phone and really get into it, but like most users are not, I mean, right. not just they're not looking for that. Like they're not, they literally don't have the equipment to do that. So um, some of it again, is just, you know, even if people were willing, which I'm not a hundred percent convinced most people are, but even if they were willing, they literally may not be able to, you know, crack it open and, you know, can't, uh, <laughs> you, it, it's not that you can't run a DOS game on a, on a, on a modern iPhone, but what would you have to do to your iPhone to make that happen? You're worried, right. <laughs> and if you mess it up, are you willing to eat the X amount of thousands of dollars that it cost you? Like, that's the other question. Um, you know, your average your average smartphone is a hell of a lot more expensive than an Atari 2600 was, and nothing you put on a 2600 was going to brick it. So that's uh, that's always something to kind of keep in mind. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Fair <laughs> points. Um, I don't know if there was any. And I, I had another question, but I don't know if anyone <laughs> else has anything to ask. Um, I'll just go again. <laughs> Um, so you, you mentioned like the Unity, it's a very Unity, Unity specific question. You mentioned the LTS versions. Yes. Um, so if you started making a game on like the 2019 long-term support version and you're planning to release your game, AKA me, this year, <laughs> should, should you, like how, how bad is it to not update to a new long-term planning? I mean, I already, I already did. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just asking, so other people can know as well because well, part of me didn't want to just because I was afraid things were going to break and things did break you know like that's, that's always happens especially with Unity. Yeah. Well, what what what's what's the worst case scenario if you don't update to a more a newer long term support? Version? I look at it. I look at it like so. If you put a roof on your house, right? Like, or no, not a roof. Uh, let's say a boiler, right? Hot water boiler, right? You have the option of, okay, well, we've got the boiler that was there. Yeah, the repair guy is messing with, or, or a car, right? It's like, how, you know, we're going to put a couple bucks into it and it'll still run. It'll, you know, we'll put a little duct tape and, and some hope and it'll be okay. It's like, or you'd say, look, it's not, it's not working. We got to rip out some of these guts and, you know, we're going to have to put a few grand into this, but then it'll be, it'll be awesome, right? Um, Long term support is like that. I, I feel like, with unity especially on mobile i think that the idea of it is sound as far as it gives you some breathing room but i think like it's only supposed to get active support for two years and like if you built against 2019 lts and this is now 2022 lts this is kind of like as soon as you launch, you are already potentially in in deprecation, you know, sunset territory. So you've 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 taken away. It's like, oh, I'm going to put in a new boiler, but it's not a new boiler. It's actually a used boiler that already has ten years on it, right? Like you you're you're setting yourself up. It's not <laughs> it's not what's the worst case scenario? Will this fail? It's that you're not really getting the benefit of the whole LTS buys you time thing, right? Like if you put it out right now, like, you know, tomorrow, right? You put it out tomorrow, let's say nothing is wrong. Everything is fine, right? But come fall when iOS 16 comes out or um, Android, what the hell are we up to? T, U, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, don't, I, don't, I should know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, when that comes out, if they, redu- you know, if they produce something that, is going to be a breaking change in like Christmas or something, then, you know, you've now that time that you might have gotten that lead time. That's the word. The lead time that you might have gotten from upgrading to say like 2021 LTS, um, you you don't have it anymore. And now you're in a situation where you have an active app in production that's live. And now you have to, you know, hurry, hurry, hurry to, to, to patch whatever the issues are, or, you know, you have to assume that unity has patched whatever the issues are. And, and you have to turn that around and get that out there before again, mobile users have zero patience. (laughs) So, and if you, you know, to a certain degree, you know, if it is a commercial game, 
any pissed off people are costing you money, especially if they've gone and put a review out there, they're costing you the people who could have bought and played your game, not just the people who already have. So I would say the absolute worst case is that you you don't pass cert, right? Like you don't, you know, there's some kind of breaking issue. And and then when you put your, um, I didn't even get into the whole review process, but especially if you're putting out a new, a new app, um, you know, or a new game or anything, they give you a much more stringent review than, than if you're doing later patches down the road. So like, especially if you're talking about an initial launch, the worst case is that you don't pass. And then they say, okay, you got to, you know, tweak it, whatever. And then you're exactly back in the boat you were already in. Um, I would say if it's at all possible to go through and, and revisit again, version controls, your friend, you can always, if you're using Git, you make a branch, put, put the new unity on the new branch, you know, run exactly your, your updates <laughs> and then, and exactly. And then if it breaks out, ah, who gives a shit, you know, you, you, now you're working on that separate branch and, and, you know, again, it's all about maximizing the time that you have to do whatever it is you need to do, right? If that's time before you launch or if that's time after you launch, that's up to you. Like, you have to kind of make that decision, but that's what it is. It's not so much the technical aspect of, is it bad to use the old system or whatever? It's how much is that time worth to you? So. I don't, it's not like a, a straightforward answer, but like, that's kind of, you know, that's the long version of it depends. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, it, it was a good answer, especially again with the mobile considerations. Like, like you said, they can update something tomorrow and everything just breaks. Like a very recent example was, I, I know that Unity said they don't support web on mobile, like the web builds on mobile. They yeah, don't yeah. technically support it. But I tried it, it anyway. It kind of works and, sometimes, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I, I tried it on my iPad and it didn't work at all. And then I updated my iOS and then it worked. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably better to just suck it up and just update to the newest one and hope that nothing breaks. <laughs> Honestly, if, you're, if you've if you already, like like for my for my Master's Thesis game, um, which I'm almost done, um, <laughs> that's Ooh. on web, uh, that's on WebGL. And I, I can definitely say that uh, pushing to WebGL is a much more laborious process on, on Unity than pushing to certainly Android. Um, iOS sometimes has some gotchas to it, but um, a lot of the issues that are WebGL specific that Unity has kind of been like, hey, you're on the web, you're on your own. Um, they are at least addressed on mobile just because it's such a larger market. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at it from the perspective of it, 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 you know, I went through this much pain to push on web. I don't want to go through that much pain for, for mobile. It's going to be less pain. Um, A, you've already made the game. So that pain at least is already taken care of, but, but B, as far as like dealing with say the audio, especially audio is kind of messed up on WebGL, but, um, dealing with those kinds of things there are way more devs who are also on your same platform unity just i mean you know android is their golden child i mean i i hate to you know no no just to consoles yeah i, I love consoles I'm, I'm a nintendo girl but 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 android is their 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 golden baby and so they definitely pour the resources into supporting that um ios too um, it's just they don't have full control over iOS because again you have to take it out of Unity and then put it into to Xcode and stuff. But um, but yeah, you just you just have a lot more support um, if you go ahead and, and actually you know try to do the port. You don't necessarily have to hold up the launch, right? I mean, this is not this is not these are not mutually exclusive options, right? Uh, um, you know, you do have some time. You could always release based on the 2019 LTS version. And then take the next, you know, four, five months and poke at the updates, see what breaks and fix it. And then you're ready for, I don't know, October or the holidays or something. So, you know, it's all about flexibility. That's dope. That's dope. Um, yeah, I, Remember, I think the that... users don't know and they <laughs> don't care. They don't know what version of Unity you use. They just want to know that the game is fun. They don't care. <laughs> this is, yes <laughs> they, you're right they, they don't care about the version but the whole other conversation about that but yeah <laughs> any other um, questions yeah, I'm not seeing any more 
any more questions coming through so i'm gonna give everybody another another couple of seconds couple of moments to ask anything otherwise i think that's it i think i think i saw cleo had posted some stuff but it was just comments i uh, think it was comments yeah 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 yes cleo you can upload apps to amazon they actually um uh, in the interest of things that are that are blue oceans um, as opposed to red oceans, they were when um, when Alexa came out, they actually were pushing pretty hard to get people to um, come up with essentially audio based games that people could play on an Alexa. And um, similar to that, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Amazon Fire, um, and now I guess Luna is their cloud platform, but. Um, it's it's android you know it's 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 android under the hood they have their own sdk you know on top of it similar to how samsung has its own sdk on top but um but you know the base of it is android so if you have a game and you're already working on it for android there's just fewer apps and fewer good apps on some of these like alternate stores i mean that's a whole other talk alternate stores but um you know if you're willing and able to to do the juggle of of some of those other considerations you know they have things like oh the icon has to be like this and your key art has to be like that and that kind of thing but if, if you're if you're willing and able to do that that is a great opportunity because you're not necessarily competing head to head with as many of the you know as the big players just because they're smaller markets um and so you know it doesn't have the scale that some of the big guys are looking for but for an indie i mean you know how many players do you actually need to turn a profit in indie? So, um, you know, it's definitely it's definitely worth looking into some of those sort of uh, unusual stores, unusual markets. You know, again, going back to what I said at the beginning about you know, kind of broaden your mind as far as what is a mobile game. Um, I remember uh, pre pandemic at a Unity Developer Day, I was chatting with this guy, um, and he, what were they doing? They were doing like system on chip uh, embedded systems work and he was looking for like a C++ programmer and was lamenting that he couldn't find anybody. And I'm like, well, you need to just explain to people that the skills they've already acquired, you know, especially like Unreal is in C++. It's like, I mean, this was a Unity talk, but um, I was like, you need to explain to people that those systems, you know, those those skills uh, cross over. Right. And that, you know, what what you're doing is it was for industry, not for entertainment. But, um, you know, I mean, users are users, right? Like it, it, you, you still want industrial users or or or, you know, healthcare users or whatever. You still want them to have a good experience. You're still trying to accomplish whatever you're trying to accomplish. And, uh, you know, it's it's the added benefit. Um, you know, one of the nice things I like about working at college is. I can see the people who use my software and I know that their lives are improved. I mean, you know, that's what they tell me anyway. <laughs> you know, it's nice sometimes to have um, games or software or, or anything where, you know, you, you know, you didn't have to murder anybody or, or you know, or whatever, or bankrupt or whatever. And, you know, you still get paid and they had a good time and you had a good time and everybody had a good time. So definitely keep your eyes, you know, keep on the swivel and look for, for those kind of, side opportunities there thanks for my ted talk right now <laughs> all right all right so i think anything oh, else i think we think we've wrapped up all the questions and i think we've actually gone a bit over the time originally um so i just want to say thanks again for taking the time to do the presentation it was awesome and it means a lot that you spent the time and just you know listen to our little nerdy questions Nerdy yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, well, somebody's got a key. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It was really enjoyed. Trust me. You, you are amazing to listen to talk and explain. You're a vibes in person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I had put my um I put my contact info up. I'll put a link to the to the slide so you guys get those links that are in there. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll put my Twitter handle in there. Um, 
I periodically peep into Twitter and, you know, drop some kind of game dev comment and then I bust out. <laughs> but my DMs are open, so, um, or you find me on Discord. I'm not usually on this Discord, but um, but you can send me a DM through Discord. And, like, if you have a question or, you know, you just want to be like, what's it like being a Black woman developer in New York? Interesting question. Totally different talk. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Other than that? <laughs> All right. All right. Later. Bye. 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 Bye.